We'll get started now. Uh, again, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Create Training Strategies Using Technical Analysis, Volume Profile, and Market Profile. Today's presenter is Linda Reschke. <coughs> Excuse me. She is president of LBR Asset Management and LBR Group. Welcome, Linda. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. My name is Tom Hartle. I am CQG's Director of Product Training. I'll be your host and moderator today. Um, first, a couple of housekeeping rules. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section uh, window at any time during the presentation. We'll have Linda answer the questions at the end of her presentation. If you're viewing the presentation in full screen mode, you can find the Q&A in the WebEx toolbar at the top of the, your screen in the drop-down menu on the far right. Now, if you're having any sound issues, please contact the host via the WebEx chat. We'll be recording today's webinar, and it will be posted within 48 hours to the events section on news.cqg.com. All registered attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest. Ms. Rasky has over 30 years experience as a trader. <clears throat> as I mentioned, today she is president of LBR Asset Management, a CPO and president of LBR Group, Inc., which is a CTA. She started her CTA, uh, LBR Group, uh, back in 1992. Her hedge fund, LBR Asset Management, was ranked 17th out of 4,500 funds for the best five-year performance by Barclay Hedge. She was first introduced to the public in Jack Swager's book, The New Market Wizards, and she has authored her own book, High Probability Short-Term Trading Strategies. Over the past three decades, Ms. Rashke has presented her research and lectured on trading for nearly a dozen organizations in over 22 different countries. Welcome, Linda, and now I'm going to turn the webinar over to you. Thank you. Just a quick sound check, if everybody can hear me okay. Does that sound all right, Tom? Yeah, you sound great, Linda. Thank you. All righty. I thought I would introduce a couple things that uh, perhaps uh, most people are aware of the market profile uh, supplement in the CDG package, but also uh, a very nice tool, uh, the volume profile uh, under studies, and uh, just show the ways that we can integrate some of uh, these tools that can be applied on linear bar charts with the conceptual framework that Market Profile does. And uh, there's a couple ways that we can use this that I'll go over. And we're going to start down from the smallest level, a single time frame type of thing, up to uh, looking at big picture structure. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look first at some very specific volume um, patterns, uh, excuse me, uh, Market Profile patterns which are pretty basic. Uh, I, I like to use market profile as a supplemental uh, type of conceptual thing, not my primary decision-making factor, but I do find it of value in certain instances. So I'll show you uh, what I do and where I set up certain specific strategies. So A, specific patterns that we can look for for unique trades that might only occur, say, uh, once every week or two in a market. Uh, B, everyday analysis, how it can be a, a, a supplemental tool in helping uh, find support and resistance levels or uh, also confirm uh, what might be considered a support or resistance on the bar charts. Uh, then next, um, how we can integrate this with momentum indicators and uh, see if we can get some synergies within two. Uh, I find that the uh, volume profile work and the market profile is very, very good for levels, whereas uh, traditional technical indicators uh, such as, uh, say, a momentum oscillator or whatever your tool of choice is, I'll use a stochastic for the purpose of this presentation, uh, is going to help do the short-term timing, so the levels with the timing. And then lastly, um, I'll show you some ways that I love to uh, look at big picture work if I'm looking at, uh, say, a couple weeks worth of data or a couple months worth of data and how you can uh, compress uh, the market profiles on CQG. It's so lovely. I think it is absolutely the best market profile type of uh, tool package out there. So hopefully this will give you some ideas to do your own work. And, you know, with that said, August so far has started out relatively slow in equities, although there's been plenty of opportunity in metals and, 
and currencies and and other markets. But uh, you know, just because it's slow, I always deem August as my research month. This is the time that I want to brush up on my studies, uh, you know, reorganize myself, clarify exactly what I'm doing. It's uh, very easy to get suckered into sloppy markets and over trading and marginal trades. So uh, this is a great time to step back and also. Uh, you know, perhaps look at some of these things and see if you can incorporate them into your game plan. Now, I know that market profile has been much in vogue in the last couple of years, and so I'm not going to go into the traditional market profile semantics, you know, the neutral day, the, you know, trend day and so forth. Uh, so I will have just three slides here that I'll just quickly review that to, uh, to me present the essence of what I get from it. And... Um, the first is that concept of value as being defined by uh, how much volume has traded over a certain price or how many times uh, the market's traded at a certain price over n number of bars or look back periods. And uh, so, so we'll call these value areas, but one thing that we're going to look at on these charts is how cleanly they show up as what I'll call nodes volume nodes to high volume points and the ways that we can use this from a strategic standpoint to A, um, mitigate our risk or B, uh, set up uh, trades because I I'm sure all you guys are familiar with this already when you get a move outside of one of these volume nodes or what I also like to call equilibrium points, uh, you're either going to uh, trend away from that or if it if it moves out and it doesn't get much uh, legs, as we say, or much volume or impulse, then it's going to gravitate back towards it. So we can consider these a little bit of strange attractors. So if price rallies and you don't see the volume come in and it rallies on lighter, lighter volume, then it's going to revert back to the mean or these value areas. So um, I, I know that CPG is going to keep these slides up for you, and you can go back and reference these uh uh, these things afterwards, but um, I really like if you, if you get a chance to Google um, auction market theory instead of just market profile, they're, they're basically the same thing, but uh, uh, you might find uh, stuff that you can read yourself as well. So um, we'll just call them uh, uh, the value areas for now and, and what's considered where equilibrium is, and then once you start to get these trend moves, uh, this one time framing or this vertical movement trending market. And this shows up uh, very obviously on the market profile chart by the consecutive rising value areas or so forth. And I think the whole trick to, to trading uh, uh, with a strategy or a methodology is, is first and foremost uh, categorizing what type of environment you're in. And in terms of the market profile, uh, terms. It's either called a bracketing market. I know Jim Dalton likes to use that word a lot. Bracketing market is the same thing as a trading range or consolidating market. And uh, there it's very important just to watch the test of the upper and, and lower end of the range and, and uh, engage in more mean reverting type of strategies versus if you are in a trending type of environment. And whether you're a day trader or a longer term position trader, it still matters a lot to get the main idea right. So in your analysis, I think it's always extremely helpful to uh, first start with a top-down approach. Not are we in an uptrend or a downtrend per se, but are we in a consolidation period? Are we starting to begin a consolidation? Or are we perhaps just beginning uh, to trend? And I think that these things will show up very obviously when we look at some of the market profile charts. So always use that as your departure point, and, and then we can take it from there. So just to, to sum up, the market profile is going to, A, show the high volume levels and, and, uh, and important levels, period, uh, whereas the traditional bar charts uh, will be able to be a little bit more sensitive to market timing decisions, you know, such as if you have a momentum uh, divergence at a key level or uh, perhaps a, a continuation pattern that's uh, ripe to uh, start moving again. So um, th these are the main things. So I thought that I would start off just with two simple concepts here. Uh, this is a coffee chart, and what I've found is that the best stuff works 
on any market. It really doesn't matter if it's IBM or the bonds or coffee. And since this uh, particular market had several instances of each thing that I wanted to emphasize to you, and I will tell you the strategies that I use, um, uh, it's good for, for a basic departure point. And the first thing that I want to point out here are these little neutral bars, as we'll call them. You can see where they're uh, very narrow, uh, narrow range bars, little uh, tiny consolidation bars. Uh, we can uh, quantify them by saying it's the narrowest range of the last seven bars, et cetera, et cetera. However, I find that the profile has a very distinct and uh, uh, prominent look to it. So it's very easy for me. I trade about 26 markets. Uh, of course, I don't trade them all at the same time, but it's very easy for me to see when a market's starting to get overbought or oversold. It's for me to look for one of these little, what I call balance bars. You see, they're all, all uh, highlighted here at the bottom with these uh, things. So these little balance bars often, not always, often lead to some type of range expansion. In the case I get range expansion, then I'll hold it for the next day's follow through because there's a very strong uh, probability that you will get follow through from one of these little bars to the next day. And most of the most of the trades that I like to look for are where we can expect overnight follow through. Although this is a great tool just for day trading as well, of course, and we'll see some ways that you can do that. So the first concept is these little teeny balance bars where everything's come back into equilibrium. Very important in a trending market uh, before you start looking for the, 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 the uh, trend to subside for you to see one of these little balance bars, as we'll call them. And then the second concept that I wanted to uh, present to you, um, and this was a terminology that uh, was uh, put out there by a friend of mine, what he calls the holes, okay? And uh, you can see here uh, this purple area here on the far left of this coffee chart was a hole, which some people like to call these single print levels as well. But they're big, uh, big gaps down or big uh, uh, sharp impulse moves where you get one-way trading. So here on this copy chart, I would describe right in the middle here or this big purple uh, area right here as being uh, one hole. And there are some of the best risk-reward trades once the market starts trading into this hole. And one thing that we've observed over time is just the high, um, high percentage of time that markets go back and fill these holes on all sorts of time frames if it hasn't been a um, slow buildup in value along the way. So two concepts that we're just going to focus on for starters is, A, the little balance bars that lead to the nice moves where you got good one-way trending action, and the second concept uh, short-term is just these holes, and we'll look and see how to trade these as well as how they end up spilling out over time. So one last uh, example, this is from last year, just to make my point that you can see at the end of this long, long downtrend in natural gas, this ended up being the low, okay, and we haven't really incorporated any other volume work yet at this point, or oscillators, but you can still see here at the bottom this final uh, totally neutral bar where everything comes into balance and you can also see this red flash on the right hand side of the chart as well as this red flash here these are what you would call your value areas which is simply where 70 percent of the price action took place so what i also like to see is overlap in the value area so it's not just the little balance bar, it's even more powerful when you have this two-day price bar overlap. And probably my best trading strategy for the last year and a half for short-term uh, one- to two- to three-day trades is where you actually have three bars price overlap. And I'll show you that. I mean, I'm not disclosing any great secrets here. It's just simply taking a volatility breakout type of methodology or uh, – uh, the range expansion off of whatever opening reading you choose to use. I use 7 a.m. Central Time, 
and then going with the market movement at that time, and that's probably uh, most successful when you have the three bars that I'll go on to show you. But here's here's just a great classic uh, impression on just a simple market profile chart looking for an occurrence that might only happen uh, once every one to three weeks, these little uh, little balance bars, you know, uh, in an overbought or an oversold type of condition, and then the range expansion in the opposite direction. So, you know what they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So you got those two main ideas now, this concept of filling in the holes or the areas where there was a little bit too fast of a markup or a markdown, you know, the market needs to come back and test those to say, are you sure? Really? Really? Are you sure? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, we're sure. We really do want to move off in that direction. So uh, now I'm just going to show you an example of how we can add into this uh, overlay uh, a little bit more comprehensive analysis for uh, pinpointing more exact uh, trade location if you are an intraday uh, you know, timing or, or, or a day trader or so forth. And this is what uh, one of my monitors on CQG looks like all the time. I have the market profile on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, I have a 30-minute chart with just a simple stochastic and a 120-minute chart. Now, I want you to notice something that I've also added into this. On the left-hand side of this 120-minute chart here, and I'll just draw a line here so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Ooh, okay. Excuse well, me, Linda. I, um, you have an annotate tool you want to use to highlight things? Yes. That's what I just clicked on. Did you like it or not? Um, we're not seeing anything on the uh, presentation itself, so you want to choose like a pointer tool, the arrow or the pen? Can you see that? One more time, please. It's a big green line that I drew on the 120 minute chart. Okay, yeah, I can see that now. Thank you. Okay. So, what you see I'm pointing to right here is these gray bars, if they're popping up, I put them so that they're not too obnoxious. And this is a tool on CQG that's called Volume Profile that's under Studies. And it's going to show you how much volume traded each price for n number of days back. And on the 120 minute chart, I like to go 10 days back. And on the 30 minute chart, I don't have it up on the 30 minute up here. I usually go three days back. And again, that's the importance of the trading over the previous three days that we'll look at. Now, a couple things I want you to notice on this crude chart, you can see Right here, I had one of my classic three-bar breakout formations. As a little note of history, this was first brought to my attention by a friend who was one of the original turtles in Richard Dennis's uh, uh, initial uh, turtle uh, program that he did. And uh, Richard Dennis, everybody likes to think that he was a 100% mechanical trader, and nothing could be further from the truth. He actually used and adjusted his leverage or add-on points by what he called structural points, okay, market structure. And one of them was what he called the three-bar breakout that I have since adopted into my repertoire. And a three-bar was simply where he had the high of uh, the bar lower than the previous two days high and the low higher than the previous two days low. So you can see here it's not an inside range day, but you essentially have the three bar price overlap in the value area. You see that? And it shows up really nicely as a coil on the 120 minute type of time frames if you're so inclined to use an ADX or something like that. Wonderful little breakout pattern that's uh, uh, good for um, is what our testing showed. Once you get the breakout from that three bar, you've got about a 70% odds that the high of this breakout um, bar will be exceeded the next day. And you can see we got our objective uh, right here. Okay, so 
I'm probably telling you more than you can actually uh, take notes on, but I know that you're all like writing this stuff down so that you can go on your research uh, project for the month of August here. So let's just back up a, a step here. We had our upside breakout on the crude, and you can see here this quasi hole, if you will, these single plant bars, this markup period here. And uh, it's very common for uh, markets to trade back and fill this hole. That's a concept that we'll revisit time and time again through this. Uh, I know we all like to uh, have that one-way non-stop trading, and that's usually the exception, not the rule. So there is a lot of back and fill here. But uh, with my 30-minute and my 120-minute, the main thing I wanted to point out was how the market tested this big volume node here. You see this? This was the uh, center of this 120-minute coil. We came down, we tested it to the tick, and at that point, we had uh, this little buy divergence on the momentum, so you could look for uh, a, mo a loss of momentum, a buy signal in the overall higher time frame upturn. And that also is probably one of the best risk-reward patterns looking for buy divergences on the shorter time frame into the higher time frame trends. And if it was so easy, it's just simply a matter of temperament and patience and, and, and not getting too anxious. It's really a matter of waiting for these things to unfold. So this, this is a perfect little example of how uh, you could look at previous support or volume areas and they held, so you have here, the level is defined by your volume node. The level is defined by the market profile and the timing, the technical timing as defined by your oscillators. So uh, that's always something that I find go hand in glove these days. Now here is another chart of the same type of feeling. This is silver. First of all, uh, do note that you did have uh, these nice a balance bar down here, if you will, or you can call it a neutral bar on the market profile chart, and that's right here at the bottom. You can see we eventually had the breakout uh, to the upside. Now, here's the trick that I use. When I get an upside breakout, my first objective is, you can see the red arrow here on the 120-minute chart, my first target is always going to be that previous volume node. Okay, that's your minimum objective. Can we get up to that previous volume node? And you can see right here on the 30 minute that actually in the process, we made new momentum highs. Now, the ways that I categorize new momentum highs is both an oscillator high as well as these push through these Keltner channels, which are an average to range function. So that tells me that there's good impulse. It quantifies the supply demand imbalance and says that there's about a 70% chance that this high will be retested. And as you know, anything better than 55% in the market is a good starting point for a trade condition. So We've got new momentum highs here on the 30 minute. Now, let's go back and look at our volume node here. If, in fact, we can start trading on the other side of this volume node, then my objective is a penetration of the upper end of this trading range. And you can see how we did actually come back and test the breakout point or the top of this range here. You can see on the market profile chart right there. And you can see that we almost tested it to the tick, as well as filling in this hole. So just to summarize, the concept of these holes, uh, don't get uh, anxious about them and think that the market failed. Instead, uh, you should be getting excited and say, this is a very common phenomena for us to go back and fill this hole if we find support at this previous range here, I should actually be getting very excited and think that this could be the launching uh, pad for a better leg up. You see, because at first glance, our eye sees this 
area up here, and then we failed and we dropped back below that previous high, you see? And so very often people say, ah, it was a failure test. But if we look at the profile charts, it does show things in a different light that the bar charts don't show necessarily, at least a daily chart. That's the problem with the daily chart. There's no differentiation between uh, these little single print areas and the big trading ranges, and we held above this previous trading range. Now, obviously, on the 120 minute chart, it sure looks like a pretty bull flag formation to me. And in addition to that, the 30 minute, you just had this gorgeous little 30 minute buy divergence. It's probably going to show up on any oscillator that you use, and that's my feeling. Pick an oscillator, any oscillator. I personally uh, prefer to use a moving average oscillator, a 310, but you can see a stochastic does the job just fine. So now, if we go back and we look at where silver was on this retracement, this test of this breakout, and now it's holding above this high volume area, that was around this uh, 2020 area. And uh, if we look at today's close, we're at 2185. It just, uh, this little launching pad here from the structure took us up in two days up to 21.75. So you can see uh, this is a, um, a very dynamic type of way of doing our analysis. The fact that price is able to clear these high volume areas and start trending above them. Uh, and we'll take this and we'll look at this on multiple time frames too. Right now we're just simply looking at daily bars, uh, but we'll, we'll look at some markets where we can put it back into multi-week type of moves as well. And hopefully uh, it'll seem pretty intuitive to you. I find that what the main obstacle for people is, is not understanding the concept. I know you guys understand this, and goodness knows, a chart is worth a thousand words. Where people get tripped up is what is the process for which I am going to be doing my end of day analysis or my nightly analysis or my preparation for the next day. You don't want to be scrolling randomly through charts uh, in the middle of the trading day. You need to have some type of process that says, okay, every day at 2 o'clock or every day at 5 in the evening, I am going to go through my markets and I am going to look for A or B or C and try and get it down to a very consistent, repeatable process for you to go through your homework. And that way what happens is you are just there for the right setup. So think of it as playing a game of tennis, your main job is just to stay in the game and keep that ball in play. And then when your opponent is pulled off court or trips or stumbles, you are there to put it away. So that's very much uh, my analogy for trading. This here is a cocoa chart. And just to drive home the emphasis again on this gorgeous little neutral bar here that may not have been so intuitive, on this 120 minute time frame, you can see right here on the 120 minute chart where this set up. But it was our three bar breakout type of pattern. In fact, here you had three bars overlap as well. It just didn't catch fire. So here uh, we had our classic high lower than the previous two days high and low higher than the previous two days low. And right away, uh, we had our trend mode up. Now, you know the best classic trend day type of profile is where you don't stop and loiter in the park. You continue to build and build and build. So take, for example, this bar here, which you could have seen, ah, you know, there we had our previous three bars. But it was pretty evident fairly early on that you were not getting that uh, constant consecutive uh, building. Um, the definition of a market profile or a trend day type of uh, uh, thing that I was taught is where you get consecutive 30-minute bars. So the high is uh, higher than the previous 30-minute high and, and, and so forth with the low. So you want to see a continuous markup or markdown on the 30-minute 
bar charts. And if you don't see that in the first two to three periods of your trading reference, then uh, you can pretty much negate the fact that a trend day is unfolding, although we have seen instances where they happen in the afternoon session as well. But that's why I do like to keep a 30-minute bar chart up as well. And I always find that if I go down to five-minute time frames, a 15-minute time frame, or, or, or too short of a time frame, it's too easy to get tripped up in the noise. You know, this really is a game of get the main idea right. And five-minute charts are great on index futures and, and so forth. But um, you, you, know, you, you don't want to, uh, to end up seeing the trees and missing the forest. It's really get the main idea right. So this is, again, once a, a, a classic uh, launch trend move up. We form the value at the higher area, and obviously the 30-minute and the 120-minute charts are supporting this with a bull flag continuation type of formation. Now, let me just show you one more additional uh, trick. If you're looking at this 120-minute chart, where do you want to put your stop? Okay, we, we, we don't want the market to go all the way back down to this previous high volume node, obviously. So we'll, uh, we'll look at some other examples here as to once the market turns and, and, it, and, it's, and it's holding, where do we want to trail our stops? We always want them initially just below that previous uh, volume node, okay? That's, your, that's my initial stop level, my initial risk. Okay, so, it, you know, this POCO, by the way, uh, went up. This was, this was around the 2375 area at the top of this markup here. You can see, I don't know, I, I hope this shows up okay, these levels on the left-hand side of this profile chart, they're in black. And uh, I hope you can see them okay because we're around uh, 2370 here, and this move got marked up to, uh, to 2500. 25 in just uh, two more trading days. So you can see how powerful it is uh, when you get these breakout bars that hold and always, you know, nothing holds 100% of the time. So we'll look at some failed breakouts too because those also set up good risk rewards. As one last caveat, I use that 7 a.m. Central time reading. So once we're trending off of that 7 a.m. time frame, I don't want to see the market trading back below that level. So that's my do or die point as to whether a breakout is going to carry or a breakout is going to fail. Whatever that 7 a.m. Central time reading is after one or two hours has passed in the day. So that's a great little filter for me. Now, I just want to expand on some of these concepts, and we'll start integrating a little bit more. Remember when we talked about the different types of trading ranges, bracketing or trending, and it should be, uh, I'm not saying anything earth-shattering when I say that the trending markets come out of the bracketing markets, and there's this law of alternation. And, of course, it's not always so perfect, but when we do get that Steady markup. I wanted to point out several things to you. First off, this rally in the E-minis that you see here on this chart, I want you to notice how each of these profile bars is fairly well developed. We don't have those big whoosh-ups that leave those holes that then can be traded back into. You see what I'm talking about? Instead, it's a very orderly, rhythmic marching to the upside, and this is what creates the most sustainable trends. So very important. Another uh, interesting thing that is just confirmation all over the place to stay with this market is that you can see this little teeny arrow at the top of the profile here, and that's the market's close. And there are extremely high odds in our testing that if you get a close outside of value, see value here is where 70% of the day's range took place or the day's trading took place. When you get a close outside of value, there's very high odds of continuation 
in the direction of that move. Of course, this is intuitive. Yes, of course, if the market closes at the top of its bar and you have a big candlestick up, all right, it's quite uh, intuitive that all these semantics, you know, are, are just different ways of saying the same thing. But what I found is that semantics resonate different ways in people's minds. So if you phrase it that a close outside of value area has 70% chance to follow through to the upside, perhaps it might trigger a different way of thinking in your brain instead of thinking, oh, okay, we just you know, close at the top of our range for the bar. Does that mean that it's overbought? You know, and of course, you can see each of these did test back down a little bit, but they also had follow through each day. So this is just one of the strongest type of trending patterns that you can have, a steady markup in value area without any of those big impulse dog pile moves that leave holes. Okay, and we'll see some uh, cases where we did leave holes and what happened. Now, I want to show you the opposite uh, extreme, and uh, this just happens to be the cows, the October cows. And this is a type of market where I see people make a lot of unforced errors, okay, meaning marginal trades. And we can get this in the currencies, periods like this. We can get this in the Russell Index lately. We can get this in all different types of markets. It just so happens that this was the ugliest uh, chart I could find at the time, giving an example of multiple holes. You can see this orange bar here. A big hole, uh, and that means that the price just got too far ahead of itself, up or down, and didn't really uh, build any platform to build on. And like you can see, the, the market goes back down, and it fills these holes. And these ultimately could be considered little price rejection spikes. We tested the previous day's high or the previous upper end of the range, and it was rejected. This does not have any big long-term forecasting implications. I want you to understand that, too, in our modeling, because everybody likes to talk about tails, okay? And tails are obvious at the bottom of a big downtrend or the top of a big uptrend, and you have that sharp price rejection spike. It only has meaning when you put it into a context. But when we tested these tails, and they happened to be in a trading range, there was zero statistical significance. It really is just noise. So we refrain from overreading into certain types of situations and uh, instead just say this is a relatively dead market. Now, to give you an update on what this market did, it actually continued in this mode for a full another week, all right? It, it chopped and, and drove people crazy for a full another week until finally, just a couple days ago, it had a huge gap up on a news event, and uh, which was uh, one of the major, uh, uh, I think it was Tyson, uh, saying that they were going to uh, go to a different type of feed that didn't have uh, uh, this certain uh, additive to it that was, was causing cows to kind of drop dead before they reached the slaughterhouse, just to be crass about it. But, uh, it, you know, uh, eventually you had this radical, radical move in five trading days. This is a huge outlier standard deviation type of move, four full points. But you can see that the market continued on chopping like this for another week before that move was hold. So that's the importance of always putting your patterns in a context and not reading too much into them in the meantime. Okay, I thought this, we're going to go through a couple walkthrough examples here. Uh, this was the dollar index, and, and uh, I wanted to go back to analyzing our volume nodes. So on the 30-minute chart up here on the upper left, you can see our high volume node, which I just highlighted by green here. And the price is trending down below this. So we're moving away from this volume node, which is bearish in its implication as long as we keep getting very short-term continuation patterns and volume to the downside. Uh, of course, on the bar charts, 
You're just simply saying that you're trending lower out of a trading range. Uh, but I do like the feeling that this volume node gives. And up here on this 120-minute chart, of course, this is the 10 days' worth of volume. And you can see that we're just about to flush below this, which is the same thing as saying we're going to test the actual price flow because uh, obviously the volume is going to coincide with where it traded in the price. Well, here we have this big spike low, a negative trending market, trending down out of sort of a neutral type of bar, not the pretty little balance bars we had. And this up here was a false uh, price rejection. In terms of filling out those holes, we filled out that hole, but we came back down below this volume node. So that's pretty negative. It's not like we had an upside breakout and tested back down just to close that. No, we actually went down to this volume node and then some. So that's pretty negative that we failed with regards to that. So in hindsight, obviously, this appears to be a bit of a bull trap. Now, just so you know, in our modeling, these little bull traps and bear traps, these false breakouts, lead to sharp moves in the opposite direction, which should not be a surprise. Uh, you have a, a vacuum there. So here we are. We're starting down uh, out of this volume node that was all across here. You can see all across here we had all this volume, and we are starting to break lower and push down to the uh, lower end of this. So what is our obvious first target? The swing low. For me, these swing lows and swing highs are magnets. So this market is going to go down, and I'm going to stay short and see how we test this. And one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to do a quick test reject, just like those cows did, and come right back up again, okay? Or we are going to see an increase in volume or consolidation down here, which means accepting these lower prices and continue lower. So that's our outcome. All we know is that we want to be positioned to the downside. We don't know if we're just going to do a quick test or we're going to continue lower, but there would be no reason to be along, and, and I think there's good uh, evidence to uh, uh, so you, you need to be short here. And so this is what actually happened. Here was the bar that we were uh, looking at at that time. Let's see here. Okay, this bar here is where we were looking at uh, coming to the downside. And you can see that we actually did go and take down that low right there. All right, so that was a pretty good flush down. Now, steady downtrend here of multiple days, steady pattern of lower value areas, and what happens? The party comes to a screeching halt with our little balance bar. You see how important this starts to be at the bottom. Not only did we have this little balance bar, but we also had a gorgeous little momentum divergence. No matter what oscillator you were looking at, you had a loss of momentum down here. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a buy yet, but you would certainly want to be uh, trailing your stops or closing out short positions or whatever at that time. And then once this market turns back up, we got the range expansion. We got the steady trend up off that 7 a.m. reading. You can see where the market closed, right at the top of that value area. And what would be the obvious play that we would be watching? We want to see, can we come back into that prior range, that previous swing low? Not only that, if we do, where is this going to uh, be a magnet to the previous high volume node? So you see how on this rally back up, we went right back to that previous high volume node. And uh, that, to me, coupled with the swing highs and swing lows are the three main things that I write down on my trade sheet as objective levels. A swing high and a swing low are the most visible chart points. And, uh, you know, that's why I, uh, I refrain from uh, Fibonacci or GAN or Trader's Pivot or any of these things. I want something that everybody can see because that's the most dominant market psychology. 
as well as these volume nodes. I just find them uh, incredibly useful, and I really did not look at them uh, until just two years ago uh, when a friend started doing the condensed profiles and pointing them out all the time. I'm like, you know, there's definitely something to this. It definitely makes uh, a lot of conceptual sense. But what is the easiest way for me to see this without fumbling uh, with a bunch of charts during the day? Uh, you know, because that's my one uh, thing that I try not to do is scroll through charts or scan charts or, or play with pages too much. And I find that if I just keep this one CQG page up, and of course I love the way that, that you can link this chart with clicking on the uh, symbols in a little uh, window there. So I just simply click on sugar or click on gold or click on uh, fruit if I want to get my bearings in the middle of the day, and, and it pops up this little uh, page for me. And um, so my eyes have gotten very used to now. And, of course, you can see here on these charts, look at how the volume node also shows back up in this area as well. So just fun little tricks, and uh, it takes a little bit of, of just getting used to and, and uh, feeling comfortable with it. And, and then seeing different cases, how they unfold uh, time and time again. Uh, nothing unfolds exactly the same way, but you still have these same principles at work. Now let's look at another interesting example here, and this was natural gas. Remember. We had this upside breakout from a three bar. Here was our three bar, where you can see this bar right here was uh, lower high than the two-day high and higher low than the two-day low, right? So I have this pop-up on my little trade sheet, so it just alerts me the next day that I've got this one-way trading type of day. And sure enough, I don't know if this was one of the report days or not. It easily could have been, because then that gas has a propensity to do that. But Again, the principles are the same. Now, what happened here? We have a hole, a great risk-reward point, and the, the stats suggest that more often than not, this hole will be filled out or traded into, okay? And uh, we had our little balance bar up here, and then we broke down and started to fill the hole. So these are great risk-reward points, and often what they'll look like is a failed flag. So I put my initiation point at the low of what looks like should be a little bull flag. So you can you see that on the 120? And usually here's the 30-minute chart. Here was my little flag low. It should have been sort of an ABC type of consolidation to the downside. And I find that very often I can put in a sell spot below this just with that initial uh, objective of trading into that hole. I don't know if we're going to get continuation or not. Sometimes we just go down a little bit. But it's, uh, it seems to be a logical place where a lot of people have their stop. And so that's sure enough what we did. We not only filled the hole, but remember, this is a little bit of a warning sign that we actually pushed below these single prints, all right? So it really shouldn't have come all the way back down into this area. But with that said, let's just see what this market continued to do. Uh, here was our big markup. And instead, we formed another three-bar balance area. So you see this bar right here. High, lower than the two-day high, low, higher than the two-day low. And of course, this set up that last downtrend that continued uh, for uh, several consecutive days down. And I believe that we went down to, uh, let me see here. Uh, I, I gosh, we went down uh, quite a few handles lower out of this. And uh, at any rate, you can look at that yourself. Um, beans, soybeans, this was a recent example. And actually, I, I had a different slide in here that I lost because I first wanted to show you a, a short trade that we made. And that was uh, the market had this first rally up right here. Now remember what I said uh, about using these high volume nodes as risk reward points. So we actually shorted the market right here because we had a good area for a stop just, ab uh, just above this little high volume node. And we only got a shallow push back down, see right to 
that other node. And so it was about a, a 12 cent trade for us, which really isn't so meaningful in the beans, but we did get a reaction down. And of course, this mark up here was on a crop report. So that's always a wild card. You can't forecast that the market's going to move like that per se. But we can note that once it came out above, this high volume node here, all right, there was a very compelling case that you could have had an initiation point there, uh, a buy stop, because we were able to trade through this volume node and start coming out the upside. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, what we did today is we formed this little 120 minute flag and we went back up for the retest. So I find that for me, the market profile and the trading and these markets is very much taking one day at a time. I mean, other than just being able to forecast the fact that we should have follow through, uh, I, I just am so humbled at this point that I really can't predict more than uh, beyond one or two days, what should we do next? What should we do next? Should I be looking for a retracement trade? Should I be looking to fill that hole, that breach of support or resistance? Or should I be looking for a possible trend type of day, not necessarily move? All right, so I added one or two things onto this chart here, and I simply wanted to show you now incorporating the dailies. And you can see here with these bonds, we had one, two, three higher lows on the oscillator and a little consolidation pattern, basically. And I wanted to show you also what a false type of breakout can look like and why the 7 a.m. reading is so important. Now, as an aside, 7 a.m. Is, is relatively arbitrary. I just use that for the start of the U.S. session. You could do the exact same thing using the start of the Asian market session in the evening, or you could use the exact same thing if you are in the European markets using, or even the European markets trading U.S. markets, uh, using the start of the Eurex session. So I just find that the start of the uh, individual uh, uh, um, zones, okay, is, a, is an excellent reference point. It models out the best for, uh, for, for seeing these trends hold or, or fail. And so here I wanted to show you this gorgeous little breakout bar in the bond, okay? So you can see up here on the profile, a narrow profile, not quite our three bar overlap that we've been talking about, so it wasn't a three bar breakout. But nonetheless, this is still something that can lead to range expansion. We had a logical upside test level up here, so there's definitely potential. Okay, swing highs are always potential targets. And uh, the structure, there wasn't anything uh, uh, saying that you had a loss of momentum in either way. Just a very neutral type of reading. So this is what we look like right here. And look how thick. I want you to notice one last thing on this 120-minute chart. Look how thick the right-hand side of the volume is here, okay? That's very important. This, this is something that can either lead to a, a breakout and trend away from the volume or we're going to fall back down into it. And let's see what actually happened here, okay? We did have our little push up to the upside. It did try the breakout. And remember what I told you, when we drop back below that 7 a.m. reading, you do not want to be long. And instead, we close outside of the value area. That is negative, and it says go home short. So obviously, a bull trap. That's what it would look like, and that's why it's so important that on this 30-minute bar chart, you would want to see consecutive bars to the upside. You don't want to start seeing this price bar overlap here. You see that? Okay, that's not a sign of a trending market. And then, of course, you can get the feeling this is what the downtrend looks like, this steady grind of bars lower. So case, case made there, it's just uh, uh, not having opinions and following the market. Now, this was interesting here uh, because 
this in and of itself is not so interesting. It's the NASDAQ. But I want to integrate now and take this out one notch higher, showing you even higher time frames. The NASDAQ, as you all know, is, uh, uh, of course, overly weighted with Apple, which has been a bit of a driver recently. However, we didn't know it was going to break out at the time that we were printing off these charts. All I know is that we had this, once again, this three-bar uh, breakout pattern here. And uh, I, what I did is, at the time, I printed off uh, this slide. Now, you can see here uh, this condensed profile. And if you go into your CQG toolbox, you will see uh, something that says uh, profile area. All right, the exact name of it is um, profile area that's under tools. If you click on tools and you click on pointer tools and you go down to the very bottom of that, you'll see something that says profile area. And I think you can go maximum 12 weeks back, and it, and it pops up a box like this on your daily chart. And when you click open, it's going to condense all this data here for you to see. And I'm going to show you some really cool, really cool tricks with doing this on the big time frame. So right here I had, uh, this is where we closed, where the red arrow is. You see right here on this chart. Uh, the little little dingy arrow there. This is where we closed. I said, boy, you know, this is a great risk reward point because we're at the lower end of this range, which means that we either hold the hole and we go up and we test the upper end of the range, or we're going to fail and we're going to close the hole and go back down to this other high volume node. So you see right away how. Uh, yes, of course, you can see on the candlestick chart uh, the range that has formed, but it gives it a different feel to me looking at these big, giant, condensed profiles. So great risk-reward for either a move to the top end of the range. It's a do-or-die point here. You see, do-or-buy, die point. You, you buy and you have a nice stop below this red line, or you short once you start to break through this red line. I love those types of setups. And so that's how it's framed out here. Uh, let's just look at a couple more of these because I think they are so important uh, just in terms of uh, the powerful image that they can uh, give us. You see how this gives a different type of conceptual framework or feeling than if we just simply look at linear bar charts. So this was pretty cool because this is copper, which has been in a little bit of an uptrend. And the main thing I wanted to show you was in, in capturing on this daily chart that uh, special toolbox, that profile area that I showed you, I just captured 12 weeks worth of data. And you can see that uh, this was our high volume node that we had our upside breakout from. You can, you can see how clearly that sticks out like a big sore thumb. And where was our whole area? Right between these orange lines. So. These orange lines, also you can see here the single print type of thing on this daily chart. I just drew uh, an orange line here. And uh, on the top of that breakout there, we had just started trading back into this area right here. So that's where we had, we had had an upside breakout and we filled in that hole. And now, of course, copper closed at 334, uh, 334, five, I think it was like right up. We made it back up to the top of this range here. So just nice little ways of framing things out. Um, same thing with gold. You can see what we're doing in gold. We're at, we closed at 133.58 today. But we've also traded down back and forth through this area. Now, keep this in mind because this is going to be our closing uh, commentary. This is condensed here, this daily uh, – daily screen capture you see here, all right? And you can see overall how jagged this chart is. Big node, big node, big node, couple holes. The market's job, the market's job over time is to gradually make a profile that's going to look something like this, okay? This is the market's job once it starts consolidating and distributing. Uh, very important. Okay, once you start to fill this all out, it doesn't do this so much on an intraday basis, although once upon a time this notion of this bell-shaped curve was a lot more powerful than it is now. But it does do it once you start to look at big-picture data. 
okay? It will eventually fill this in a little bit better before it can have a more sustainable trend. And I'll show you a couple cases of that. Just two stock charts because this works lovely with stock charts, okay? This was uh, 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 not this Sunday night, but the Sunday night before when I was starting to put together this presentation for you. And what I did is I captured, uh, this was Caterpillar. Uh, I thought it looked like one of the more promising uh, uh, ones that wasn't too marked up. And you can see that we had a high volume note here of all this trading range. Very important that price is above this node. You see that? Very important. Uh, it, it really uh, is going to uh, give you that much more confidence in trading in the direction that the market is moving away from this node. It's nothing more than thinking that price is starting to trend above a market profile breakout. So this was Caterpillar at the time. And uh, in the next two days, we came in Monday, and we rallied right up to this area up here on this upside breakout. So visually, we left, we had this nice little hole that we could fill in, and we could get back up to this previous trading range area. And that's exactly what we did. So I thought that that was pretty cool, showing how this formed a base underneath it. You see? You get that picture? And this is really, guys, it takes like one minute to do this, less than that, 10 seconds to do this little screen capture here. Uh, it's just such a lovely tool. I've not seen this on any other software platform, just how easy it is to use. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful for, uh, for these tools that are in this platform. Now let's just take an opposite case. Yes, Tesla. Have you guys seen these things? I've seen a couple of them driving around Chicago. These are hot little cars, you know. They look really cute. And I hear they're super, super fun to drive, okay? So here's the profile chart of Tesla all condensed. You can see that we did have this move up out of this high-volume node here, right? This big base that was back down around here. And now look at how gappy it's gotten. Here's this huge goal. This was Sunday night. And I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, there's no way that this is sustainable up here unless you sit there and fill out a boring sideways range to build some value up here. Remember, auction market theory, price rallies and rallies until there's no more volume up there, and then it's not sustainable. It's going to revert back to the mean. And where did Tesla close today? I thought I saw it somewhere down around that. Uh, uh, 139 or 140, I think we traded back down to there. So you can see exactly what we did. Boom. We filled in the hole so far, okay? So we're starting to trade back down and fill in this area. I don't know how much further we'll go down. It's either going to start to trade and range and zone out here and start to build a line, or else we'll, we'll just continue back down a little bit. So you can see how... Big picture, it just gives you one more feel uh, that, that this was not a sustainable rally. Uh, you had a heck of a markup on a gap that I believe was earnings related, and now we're going back down and we are filling in this hole. I don't really have any great support until you start looking at this little volume area here, which comes in somewhere around, I know the numbers are hard to read on the chart, but like 136. 134 really would be a better support area. Uh, so anyway, we'll see how that plays out. But I just think that's cool that I uh, that these two examples sort of unfolded in the way that they did. Now I just want to I've got a lot more slides, but but most of them are uh, I've got them the essence of most of them here. I'm going to start speeding this up a little bit so that I've got time for questions because I know that it was such a, a grueling, high-volume, active trading day that everybody's exhausted today, right? Okay, I'm being facetious. IBM, IBM, oh, dear, poor, poor big blue. High-volume note here, and what happened? We broke down from that, all right? And here, the second high-volume note, and we had this gap here. And now, what did we do over the last week? We took out that swing low. So pretty evident that once this market started trending uh, below these high volume nodes, it just gives you that much more confidence in your structure and so forth. And here's the daily bar chart on the left, and here is the volume profile on the right. And to me, they go hand and glove. But 
the oscillators, here's your stochastic. It was not oversold at this point, just a sloppy sort of meandering thing, at least in a downtrending market or something where you are moving away from the value area. The tendency is that this will hit that oversold level, so stay short until you at least push down into those oversold levels. That's my rule of thumb, of course. If you're long in a downtrending market, you rarely get all the way back up. Uh, keep that in mind as well. Um, so here, uh, just to sum up a couple things, I wanted to, again, reinforce that idea. Of here's our three-bar overlap, our three-bar overlap. This was from the beans last year. You can see the uptrends, the best uptrends happen with this steady pattern of rising value areas. Very orderly consolidation, uh, little periods of three bar overlap. This is a bracketing market, meaning that you're forming a trading range. The only thing you can do in bracketing markets is look at tests of highs, tests of lows. Everything else is pretty marginal in the middle. Don't make trades in the middle of a trading range. Don't initiate at points that are right in the middle of a high volume node. It is the worst risk reward point that you can choose, all right? You'll be much better once the market has moved away from a volume node and tipped its hand, okay? Here's a case where, indeed, it started tipping its hand. You know, why risk getting chopped up in the middle of this mishmash? Wait until you get that range expansion or the trend out of these balance bars and you start making these consecutive higher areas. Next, this is showing the large uh, large summation here of these balancing pictures. This is where we are now in the beans, but it was a constant period of building value at higher levels. You see how this level is higher than this level? Again, that's a very bullish type of construct. Okay, I know I'm skipping fast, but I wanted to show you uh, one, one or two couple key things here. You can see the little blocks, the little trading ranges that build value area. Compare this to this, all right? This was silver, and, of course, I picked extremes to make my point, that markets that go up too fast without these consolidation areas, with these single prints, with these biggest uh, dog piles in, without stopping to build the value along the way are the ones that are most, at risk for this uh, total failure. And you will see that in stocks, you will see that in commodities, you will see that in anything. Very important to stop and build the value along the way, sort of like the S&Ps have done. Uh, this was just an interesting little case because you wouldn't really see it on the daily charts. This was the yen when it was breaking down last year. And obviously we broke down from this big trading range and flush down low, and this was just simply a 240-minute chart. I love the 240-minute charts for the currency. What you do not see in this particular chart initially, unless your eye is trained to see it, is that we actually did build a lot of value along the way here. So as, as, as people's first instinct to start shorting this market after it's had this huge whoosh down, all right? So if we just go back uh, to um, – if I just go back down to that slide, it would be very easy, almost a sucker's to play, to say, gee, this looks like a great short right there. This, is, this market's going to go back down to here. Why shouldn't it go back down and retest those lows? Why shouldn't it go back down and retest those lows? Well, I'll tell you why because we stopped and we built a lot of range or value on the way back up. But now is support, all right? And this is what it shows up as in the profile chart, okay? This is where we were there. And you can see underneath we're above this big, giant volume node, if you will. And this has really developed strong support that was going to keep us, at that time at least, from making a full retest down on the lows despite what that bar chart looked like. And then here's what happened. Okay, this was where we were looking at previous little selling area, but instead we actually found support at the top of this previous value area. You see how this works? 
you know, it's like everybody knows this stuff, seriously. It's not like, you know, you need to have a master to get this. It's just really a matter of training your eye to see it and increasing your awareness of it. That's all it really is. So this is what built the platform for a better move up until eventually you can see we're still moving higher. And now what's happened, we filled out more range here and our value area, our volume note, has actually even shifted higher. That was a very positive development. Until eventually, this was like rallying a whole lot higher. This is where we were looking at this initially. Eventually, we pushed up to a level where there wasn't the volume. We couldn't sustain it, and we started dropping back down into it. Uh, so um, that said, lastly, the S&Ps. This was an example for last year, and then I'm going to show you right where we are currently in our structure. Okay, this is a 240-minute chart again on the s and I love the 120 and the 240. Obviously, a little bit of copy formation. Now, what have you learned in this so far? Okay, here you can see we basically had a type of hole. And this is nothing more than looking at a breach of this support level on the bar chart. Here's what it looks like on the market profile. All right, this was, this was our, our little area that we ended up dropping back down below when we broke out the downside of that little top. And we started filling in this hole. And we actually sold off all the way down. I, you can't really see it here. This is where the price was at the time that I did this chart. Back to this big volume node right here, all right? And then what did we do after we went in and we filled in this hole area? We traded back and forth, and we rallied back up again. So what we did is we spent time developing this whole area here. We developed this whole area extensively with range trading, and this was at the 1380 handle last year, and that's what built such a sustainable base for this last leg up that we've had this year, all right? You can see it's a lot of consolidation, a lot of back and forth, a lot of development. All right, and this, this started to get more and more developed. You can see how it's filling in here until we get one big, giant uh, profile. And, and again, that's what gave us this nice launch. Now, look where we are right now, okay? What do we have right now? These S&Ps are closing around this 1680 handle. All right, we had two big high volume nodes here so far, and this is going back looking at the previous 12 weeks. 1683.50, that is the big level that fills out right here, okay? So we've got a little bit of a potential hole here as we start dropping through this um, 76 handles, 1676, not that far away. If we start breaking out through the downside there, you potentially have some hold that we could back and fill in this level, and this big support level is at 1644. So that will be something to keep your eye on to see how that plays out, and I hope that this has been insightful from A, showing a little small uh, – breakout bars that you can trade, B, looking for support and resistance, and perhaps momentum buy or sell divergences at these support and resistance levels, to C, to noting if you're in that trending mode where you get that steady pattern of higher value areas, in which case your main strategy should be to buy in the first hour. Always in a trending market, the first hour is going to give you your best trade location, or if you're in a bracketing market, be very careful at the upper and lower parts of that trading range. And then lastly, you can see the value in looking at this big structure, and it's just such a lovely tool, so easy to use, using that profile area grabber on the trade station, or rather the PQG, and I can go back and I can look at something in, in 12 weeks with uh, one mouse click. I like the volume profiles. I like to go back three days. With, uh, with the 30 minute bars, and I like to go back 10 days with the 120 minute bars. If you want to, you can experiment with just the current day session on a five minute chart, perhaps the S&Ps, 
but honestly, I think that you can train your eye to see exactly the same thing in the bar chart. So that concludes um, that concludes my presentation, and I hope I uh, have uh, time here for some questions, and I haven't uh, put you all to sleep on top of a very long, long, uh, slow day today. But I want to thank CQG for giving me a chance to uh, uh, present the tools that I've found uh, uh, invaluable now with their platform, and uh, hopefully you can have some fun playing with these things as well. Well, Linda, very, thank you very much for such a very uh, thorough and uh, educational uh, presentation. I do have a couple of questions here that I'd like to pass back to you. The uh, first one came in pretty early, and it was, um, um, is the information obtained from the TPO chart the same as the information provided by the volume profile chart? Do you look at both? You know, they, to me, um, if you condense them up, it's going to show the same thing. So if I sit there and I look at the uh, volume profile for three days back and, and I capture the, uh, the market profile just for three days, it's going to have the exact same uh, silhouette of the distribution, if you will. So okay. uh, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, you might have just answered this at the end, but I'll run it by you again here, too. How many days do you use to combine to see the big market profile? Is there a standard five days or 20 days? Um, what? Well, actually, for um, for those last charts that I was showing where I really want to go back and look at structure, I like to go back three months. I don't think you can go back more than that on your uh, your little profile area that grabs it. I think it will only go back 12 weeks. But I find that, regardless, that's sufficient for my purpose. Uh, I really find that uh, 10 days is going to give you a lot to work with, uh, you know, in terms of looking if there's volume levels up higher or lower. And most of the uh, swing trading type of time frames, like, for example, gold, you know, we sell off three or four days, we rally up three or four days, you know, a 10-day look-back period is going to give you plenty to – to look at the volume nodes there. In fact, with the Australian dollar um, and gold today, they all had had a good little correction down, and uh, you know we were looking to see if they could get back up to that previous high volume node, and it was a really good reference point just going back 10 days. So I hope that answers you. Okay. Um, here's another question, and I can actually let you uh, catch your breath for a second and answer it. It's how to get the volume nodes on this side of the chart. So if you just right-click on the chart and uh, add study and type in uh, VP, you'll see volume profile shows up, and that's um, the, the chart study that she's actually using that's showing those volume uh, nodes. Um, then another question was those long-term profiles on CQG. Um, what is the, t the tool you're using for that then again? That's uh, also if you just go to um, uh, the pointer tools, isn't it? Yes, the pointer tools, you click on tools and pointer tools and go down to profile area and it'll give you a little X and it's almost like a snagit type of functionality that you can uh, uh, grab it and uh, grab a little rectangle of data and then it'll just analyze that data for you. You right click and it'll say open market profile and voila. Okay. Great. Well, that's um, all, all the time we have. If anyone has any other questions about Market Profile itself, our product specialists are also w very well trained in it, and you can just um, send an email into them, and they'll be happy to do some uh, private one-on-one -on -one training. Again, Linda, I want to say thank you very much for such a great presentation. I know everybody enjoyed it. Um, this is going to conclude our webinar. And again, everyone will receive a link to the recorded version that will be posted within um, 48 hours. Uh, so thank you again, everybody, and especially thank you, Linda. Thank you, Tom. It's good seeing you again, or talking to you online, rather. Okay. Take care, and we'll, I'm sure I'll see you at the FIA then. So. All righty. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.